Today I want us to conclude the Living on a Margin series. Um, I, I read this this week, a pet store delivery truck was making its rounds and each time it came to a stoplight, the driver would get out, take a two by four and start banging on the side of his truck. After seeing it happen a couple of times, another man stopped and asked him, said, what are you doing? He explained, well, this is only a two-ton truck, and I'm carrying four tons of canaries, so I have to keep two tons of them in the air all the time. <laughs> Some of you are like that truck driver. <laughs> you need to lighten your load. And that's why we've been doing this series on living on a margin that I've been having uh, our pastors teach you. I gave them the material to, to teach. I gave them the, the principles and I said, I want you to deliver uh, this to our family because we, we all need it. Now I wanna begin with a little survey, okay? My first question is, um, how low do you let your gas tank typically get before you refill it, okay? How many of you would say, I only let mine get down to about a quarter empty and then I, I refill it? Can I see your hands? Oh, you're just so spiritual. Okay, all right. <laughs> <laughs> ba 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 to you, okay. All right, how many say, uh, when it hits half full, then I, I refill? Okay, all right, good. How many of you would say, I wait till it's three quarters empty and then I refill? Right, go ahead. All right, some of you are just lying, okay. <laughs> Okay, and how about the rest of you who would say, well then I wait till it gets five miles past empty. Can I see your hands? <laughs> yeah, look at this. All right, okay, next question, next question. How many of you have ever run out of gas? Okay, if you've run out of gas, I want you to stand up right now. I want you to just see, you. if you've ever run out of gas, look at all these people. <laughs> all these people have run out of gas. All right, thank you. Thank you, you can be seated. <laughs> now I would like to ask, third question, would any of you like to tell us why you ran out of gas? <laughs> I wanna give you 10 reasons we run out of gas. I want you to write these down because every one of them parallel your spiritual life, your emotional life, your relational life, your financial life, Every one of them parallel uh, uh, situations in your life. 10 reasons why we run out of gas. Because can you run out of gas emotionally? Of course you can. Spiritually, of course you can. Can you run out of gas in a relationship? Yep. Can you run out of gas financially? Yep. So every one of these 10 reasons why cars run out of gas actually parallel why you run out of gas in your life and why you need to live on a margin. So write these down. Number one, uh, the first reason you run out of gas is not starting out with a full tank. Now, we talked in this series, one session, Pastor Buddy, we talked about how you start your day sets your day. And if you don't start your day with a full tank, you're gonna be running on empty by the end of the day. You have to start your day with a full tank, emotionally, spiritually, and that's why you need time with the Lord. Okay, number two, second reason we run out of gas, being too busy to pause and refuel. Now we've all done this, you're in a hurry, you're busy, and you know you need to get gas, but you think, I'll just push it a little bit further because I don't have time to pause, I don't have, I'm already late for this appointment, I don't have time to stop and get gas. And when you're too busy to pause and refuel, uh, you're gonna run out of gas. Now, that's true in your life. If you don't have a regular period of refueling spiritually, refueling um, emotionally, re refueling, renewing your relationships, you're gonna run out of gas. Okay, number three. Unaware of hidden leaks that are draining me. You can run out of gas if you don't know there are some leaks in your gas tank. And that certainly has parallels to your life. That there are often hidden leaks in your life that are draining you all the time and that's why you're running on empty. 
Now, there are two big categories of hidden leaks, relationships and responsibilities. Everybody here could give an example of how a relationship has drained you. Sometimes they're not hidden, but sometimes they are. And you don't realize what a drain this particular relationship is having on you, how it's sapping you of your energy, your creativity, your strength, uh, your walk with the Lord and all these things. Relationships can be hidden, hidden leaks in your life and so can responsibilities. And the more you've got, the more possible leaks. So the more responsibilities you've got, um, the more it's likely you're gonna spring a leak in one of those and that's gonna drain your tank and you're gonna be running on empty. Okay, here's the fourth one. Ignoring the owner's manual and pushing my car farther than it was created to go. If you pick up that owner's manual, which you have never read, it's still there in your glove compartment, <laughs> and you've never ever looked at it, and you've owned your car for five years, it'll tell you how far your tank will take you. And it will tell you how far that car was designed to go even on regular or uh, supreme or whatever gas you're putting in, in your car. And they've tested it over and over and over and over and the creators, the manufacturers, the designers know exactly how far your, your car will go given how many miles per gallon it's gonna get and how many gallons you've got in your tank. And I don't care how much faith you've got, your tank isn't gonna get any bigger. I believe I have a bigger tank. I know it says it'll only go this many miles, but I believe it was. All the faith in the world isn't gonna give you a bigger tank. It's got the tank that the creator gave it. Now, this is your owner's manual for life, the Bible. And the Bible tells you what you can and can't do with your life. If you ignore the owner's manual, you're gonna run out of gas. And all over the world, in every culture, people are Emotionally running out of gas, relationships are dying, careers are dying, dreams are dying because they're not paying attention to the owner's manual. God gave you a certain size tank and you just have to live with that fact. And if you ignore it, well, you just ignore it to your own detriment. But ignoring the owner's manual, pushing my car further than it was created to go, pushing your body further than it was created to go, pushing your mind further than it was created to go, pushing your emotions further than God created them to go, it means you're gonna, you're gonna run out of energy. For instance, in this book, it says, uh, every seven days you take a day off. That's so important, God put it right there in the big 10. It's in the 10 commandments. Right along with don't murder and don't commit adultery, it says every seventh day you take a day off. Are you breaking the Ten Commandments? Now it's not a day off, it's not a Sabbath. If on your Sabbath you're, you've got your honeydew list and you're trying to catch up with all the stuff you didn't get done the other six days. A, a, a Sabbath is for rest, rest your body, refresh your soul in worship, renew your relationships, revitalize your life. That's what a Sabbath is for. All that's a part of it. Recreation can be a part of your Sabbath. Worship is a part of your Sabbath. Rest is a part of your Sabbath. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do is go home and take a nap. Because God says, you're wired. Did you know that every seven days your heart beats just a little bit different? Studies have shown that. Did you know that during the, the French Revolution, they outlawed the Sabbath in France because they're trying to get rid of everything Christian. Uh, and within a few years, they had to restore it because of the health of the nation plummeted. It literally fell apart. So they had to restore the day of rest. That's in the owner's manual. If you ignore it, your tank isn't gonna get any bigger. It's not gonna go any further. And if you're burning the candle at both ends, you're not as bright as you think you are. All right, uh, number five. Uh, a fifth reason we run out of gas is hurry, hurry. Because the faster I drive, you know this, the faster you run out of gas. If you're driving 80 miles an hour, you're gonna use up a whole lot more gas than if you're driving 40 miles an hour. Driving fast, waste gas. 
hurry in your life depletes your emotions, your spirit, your energy, your body. What's the speed of your life right now? What's the speed of your life right now? If you're going at record speed, you're like a speedboat or a race car, you're burning fuel, emotional fuel, spiritual fuel, mental fuel, much, much faster than if your pace was a little bit slower. And that's why in the very first message in this, we talked about, I, I did that message on uh, s- slowing the pace to make the space for margin uh, in your life. Hurry, it can cause you to run out of gas faster. Okay, number six. Uh, a sixth reason we, we run out of gas is being distracted and not watching my gauges. Now they're right there in front of you and you can see the gauges on oil and on water and radiator and on your gas tank. Uh, and they're there, maybe either you're not watching them because you're distracted or maybe you don't believe them. And you look at it and it says empty, you go, I don't really believe that, it's not really empty. You know, maybe it's broken and wishful thinking. And uh, when you don't watch the gauges in your life, that are the warning signs that you're going too fast or going too far or you're not recharging, you're not renewing, you're not, you're going to end up in the ditch. So what are uh, the gauges? you need to watch. Oh, there are lots of them. Um, Sleep is a gauge. Are you getting enough sleep? That's a gauge. And if you're not getting enough sleep, that's a warning light in your line saying, danger, Will Robinson, you you need to watch out. You're not getting enough sleep. You know, for me, I've noticed weight is a gauge. And that when I'm overstressed or I'm trying to do too much, I put on Wait, it's a clear thing. Now, right now, I happen to be, they've been testing a bunch of medicines on my brain, and some of them are, they said, you're gonna gain a bunch of weight. Oh, great, that gives me a great excuse, good, thanks. (laughs) But the moment I'm off of them, I have no more excuse. But weight can can be, uh, irritability is a gauge that you're going too fast, or you're trying to go too far, or you're trying to do too much, If you're irritable and the people closest to you, your friends, your spouse, kids, coworkers, say, man, you're really touchy, you're really irritable. That is a warning light. That's a gauge you should be watching. That if you're overly irritable, you're not getting enough input. You know, in in Israel, there are two great lakes. In the northern part of Israel is the Sea of Galilee, and in the southern part of Israel is the Dead Sea. And between those two lakes is a river called the Jordan River. And it runs out of the Sea of Galilee in the north and enter, empties into the, sea, the Dead Sea in the south. The Sea of Galilee is a beautiful lake. They still do professional fishing on it. It's vibrant, it's alive, it has a lot of life in it. Uh, there's farming around it and there's fish in the sea, in the ocean, I mean, or in the lake. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a beautiful lake. Uh, but the Dead Sea literally is dead. There's nothing living in it. And it's full of salt and full of all kinds of minerals and chemicals. And it's so, so dense, it's buoyant, you can't actually sink in the Dead Sea. I've gone swimming in the Dead Sea and you get out there and you're just so buoyant because there's so much salt. It's, inc- it's more briny than the ocean. What's the difference between a living Sea of Galilee and a dead sea? The, the Sea of Galilee takes in and it just gives, and it gives out. The Dead Sea just takes in. You have to have a balance in your life of taking in and giving out, taking in and giving out. But when you have more giving out than you are taking in, that's called stress. And when your personal life is outpaced by your professional life on the balance, that's called stress. And you're setting yourself up for burnout and overload and a lot of other things. So being distracted, not watching your gauges, uh, relationships can be a good gauge on am I trying to do too much, too fast, too soon. Um, As I said, impatience, how patient are you, things like that. Number seven, a a seventh cause of running on empty is uh, simply being overloaded. 
You're carrying too much weight, like that story of the guy who's carrying four tons of canaries in a two-ton truck. The more I carry, the sooner I'm gonna run out of gas. The heavier load you are carrying, the more the dial is gonna go down faster, and you're lying to yourself when you say, well, I can handle this. I just took on another project. I just took on another relationship. I just took on another commitment. And, and you can't keep, you can get so many irons in the fire, you put out the fire. So you can be overloaded. And the more overloaded you are, the more you're gonna, your gas tank's gonna be depleted faster. I remember years ago, uh, I wanted to take my kids when they were real young to Tahoe on a vacation. And we had a staff member in the church who had a trailer. And it just so happened that my truck had a trailer hitch on it. So he offered to loan me his trailer. And so we loaded up the kids and we headed off to Tahoe. And I, I didn't remember that the more weight that I was pulling with that trailer behind me, the fewer miles per gallon I was gonna get. Because it, it takes more gas to pull more weight. And I'm heading up the grapevine Highway 5, north of LA, up that steep, steep climb, and there's a strong wind gust coming the other way, pushing. And I can see the gauge going about that fast. And I'm going, it's a long way to Gorman, <laughs> if you've ever been up there. And, and sure enough, I just watched it go, and there was nothing I could do, and I ran out of gas on the freeway, and I had to hike up uh, the, you know, the, the Grapevine Mountains to get up to Gorman and, and then get back. By the time I got there, I was the one who was depleted <laughs> because of all that and carrying the gas back. So when, you, when you're overloaded, you're gonna, you're gonna run out of gas sooner, okay? Uh, number eight. An eighth reason we run out of gas is pressure to do it now. Pressure to do it now. In other words, rapid acceleration waste gas. You know that. You know the guy when you're at the stoplight and the hot rider over next to you, he's going vroom, vroom, vroom. And, and, and as soon as the light turns green, he, he puts the pedal to the metal, he just wasted a whole lot of gas. Rapid acceleration waste gas. This happens in your life. When you got something to do and you're trying to do it too fast, your gauge, your emotional gauge, your spiritual gauge, your mental gauge, your relational gauge, they're just going like this real quick. They're all going, because you're trying to do it too fast. You're putting the pedal to the metal, you're, you're pushing it, you're, you're trying to um, um, do it faster than you should normally do it. So, rapid acceleration waste gas. Number nine, this is, hits close to home, pride. Pride can cause my tank to get empty, why? Because I'm assuming the limits of my tank don't apply to me. And some of you, you think you're Superman. I can do it, I can handle it. And you think that none of the laws of nature, none of the laws of God, none of the ways that God wired us with our bodies and our minds and emotions uh, really apply to you, and it's really arrogance. Ego will cause you to get an empty tank real quick. Nothing will drain you faster than arrogance and ego and pride because you think, I can do it, I can, I can go, and you're pushing, 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 and then you're eventually gonna hit the wall because you didn't stop to refill. And then finally, number 10. Number 10 is when you have no margin. In other words, not allowing time to fill up. And that's what we're talking about in this series, where you don't have any time, you, you, you didn't make enough time, you knew you were low on gas, but you didn't leave early enough for that appointment that you could actually stop and refill and so you rush out the door in a car with an empty tank or near empty tank, and that lack of margin, you didn't plan a buffer, you didn't plan a little extra time so you get gas, and so you're gonna run out of gas. Now, in looking at those 10 things, many of you, I know, you're running on empty. You're running on empty because I can see it in your faces. 
and I can see it the way you walk into a church service. How you doing? I'm okay, Pastor Rick. Yeah, right. Liar, liar, pants on fire. And, 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 and people say, how you doing? Oh, great. Under the circumstances, well, what are you doing under them? <laughs> circumstances are like a mattress. You get on top, you rest easy. You get underneath them, you're gonna suffocate. So the reason I wanted to do this whole series, and if you missed any in the series, the nine messages, you need to go online and watch them. I, I did it last week. I listened to every message. Of course, I taught several of them, but... Uh, the, the ones in the middle, um, I listened to every week. I came and listened to them. And then last Sunday, I actually sat down and watched the entire series back to back. And I took about 35 pages of notes. Just sat down and watched it online. It would be a good thing for you to review uh, the eight principles that we taught um, uh, in, in this series. Now, during this series, remember we taught that, that margin is the space between my load and my limits. And margin is having some breathing room in your life. It's not cramming every moment uh, with activity. It's not cramming your budget, and not having any, any spare margin in your budget. It's, it's creating some reserves so you aren't running on empty all the time. And we talked about how you need margin in your physical and emotional and financial and all time and everything. And in this series, uh, as in this last message, I just wanna again review the eight principles because they're all important. Remember we talked about making space, making space and time to refuel. We talked about slowing down and, and so you don't waste energy. If you're going too fast, you're wasting a lot of energy. Uh, we talked about starting your day right. Make sure your tank's full at the start of your day. Uh, and have a time with God. Talked about learning contentment, and knowing your limits. We talked about relationships matter most and, and love is a priority. We talked about worrying less and trusting God more because more people burn out from worry than from work. It's worry that causes burnout far more. Anxiety causes more burnout than work does. And we talked about expecting the best, which is faith, while planning for the worst, which is wisdom. And the Bible says it's wise to plan, expect things to go wrong. And then last week I did that message on video on how to prune your life for greater fruitfulness. Now today, what I want us to do is look at how do you keep your tank full? And in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30, Jesus says this. If you are tired, all right, we can just stop right there. That's most people. If you are tired from carrying heavy burdens, that's overload, that's no margin. Come to me and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and then learn from me for I'm gentle and I'm humble in spirit and you will find rest for your soul. Now, for the yoke I share with you is easy to wear so the load is light. Now, I'm going to give you five or six steps on how to keep your tank full uh, today. The first four are all in that section of scripture right there. The first four are all right there. So why don't you write these down? Number one, first step, if you want to have a full tank, keep it full, get fed up. Get fed up. And I'm talking about get fed up with how I've been living. You gotta get dissatisfied. Nothing happens in your life until you get satis dissatisfied with the way your life is. As long as you're willing to live in a rut, as long as you're willing to live stressed out, as long as you're willing to live overextended, as long as you're willing to live sick and tired of being sick and tired, nothing's gonna happen. You could go through this entire series of nine incredible messages on how to live a more sane, peaceful, rather than pressured, significant, rather than stressed life, and do nothing about it. And a year from today, you'll be just as stressed out, and you'll be just as tired, and you'll be just as overloaded. Why? Because you didn't get fed up. Nothing happens until you just get dissatisfied. Go, I'm not gonna live this way anymore. And I don't know what it's gonna take in your life to decide, 
I'm not going to live this way anymore. You might have heard nine messages and go, yeah, that's all good, but you're still going to live the same way. Stressed out, overextended, running on empty, pressured, tired as a dog, and all these things, because you never intended to make a change. You didn't get fed up. Now, what causes us to get dissatisfied? What causes us to, um, to finally make a change in our lives? Pain. Pain. We don't change when we see the light. We change when we feel the heat. And when you feel, when the heat gets hot enough and you end up in the hospital and you're flat on your back, sometimes God has to lay you flat on your back to make you look up to him. In Psalm 23 it says, he makes me lay down in green pastures. Has God ever had to make you lay down because you weren't smart enough to lay down on your own? He makes, sometimes the, the shepherd has to make the sheep lay down because you, you've done too much, you've done enough. You need to recharge, you need to refuel. Nothing happens. Now, the first part of the verse says this, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. If you are tired from carrying heavy burdens, well, you gotta recognize you're tired, you gotta recognize you're carrying heavy burdens. Are you tired of running on empty? Are you fed up with the pace of your life? Are, are, are you willing to do something about it when you say, I'm gonna change somehow, I refuse to live this way anymore, something's gonna break if I don't change? Yeah, well, if you make that decision, you won't break, you're gonna have a breakthrough. Now, if you don't get fed up with the pace that this culture teaches you to live, you only have two choices. Break down or break through. Because nobody can live the pace of the American dream the way it's processed. This last week we had two very famous Americans take their lives to suicide. Successful, but worn out. Successful, but stressed. Famous, but not fulfilled. Having a lot of money, but not a lot of meaning. A lot to live on, but not a lot to live for. And we see that this is increasing. We know suicide is increasing in our society. It's even hitting kids. And the stress on those kids is coming from those little cell phones, which are comparison tools to compare yourself to everybody else on social media. And, and, and so either break down or break through. You gotta get fed up. If you're tired from carrying heavy burdens. Now, if you say, okay, Rick, I'm in, then this might be one of the most significant messages you've ever heard. So let's go through the next step. Step number two, get fed up is one. Step number two is come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. In fact, Jesus in this passage uses three verbs. Come, take, and learn. Come, take, and learn. That's these next three steps. First he says, come, to me. Now, he says, come to me and bring me the good in your life, the bad in your life, the frustrating in your life, the painful in your life, the shameful in your life, the exhausting in your life, everything. Come to me and I will give you a sermon. <laughs> oh no, that's not what it says. Come to me and I will give you what? Rest. Rest. Now, I want you to notice, come to me and I'll give you rest. That's the second phrase. Here's the second step to refilling your tank, is to come to Jesus. Uh, I want you to notice who you're to come to, and I want you to notice what he promises to give you. First, who are you to come to? He doesn't say, uh, come to church. He doesn't say, come to religion. He doesn't say, come to rules. He doesn't say, come to rituals. He doesn't say, come to regulations. The antidote for the stress and the overload that you feel in your life is not a plan for time management. That's not a bad thing, but it's just not the antidote for your soul. Uh, a, a plan for time management, it's not a program for stress relief. It's not a philosophy, it's not a pill. It's not a plan, program, philosophy, pill. It's a person. It's a person. Come to me, me. 
What you need is not a religion. What you need is a relationship. The answer to the stress in your life is not a plan, program, pill. It's a person. Come to me, Jesus says. I'm the one who made you. I know everything about you. He's God. Come to me. Now, in the Bible, uh, people came to Jesus for all kinds of things. Some came for forgiveness. Some came for healing. Some came for advice. Some came for eternal life. Some came for food. Some came to criticize. Some came to question. Some came as skeptics. You know what the thing is? Jesus didn't care why people came to him as long as they came. Jesus doesn't care why you come to him as long as you come. And you can come and say, God, I'm just wiped out. I'm tired. I'm worn out. I'm stressed. I'm depressed. I'm lonely. I'm guilty. I'm ashamed. I'm angry. I'm bitter. I'm unfulfilled. I'm worried. Jesus doesn't care why you come. Just come. He says, come to me. Come to me. The answer is a person. Come to me and I will give you rest. Now, look at this verse on the screen. In John 6, 47, Jesus says this. Whoever comes to me, I will never reject. So you don't have to worry. Well, you, you don't know all the stuff I've done. It doesn't matter. Jesus says, come to me. But you don't know my background. Come to me but you don't know what I'm doing right now, come to me. But you don't know the stuff I plan to do tomorrow, come to me. Doesn't matter your past, your present, your future, you just come. Jesus says, come to me, I'm the answer. Not a seminar, not a therapy, not a book, not a tape, not, not all this other stuff, come to me. And he says, I will never reject you. Now notice what he gives when we come to him. He says, whoever comes to me, uh, come to me and I will give you rest. Now later in the verse he says, I will give you rest for your soul. Now that's much deeper need than physical rest. Because honestly friends, your problem isn't tired muscles. Your problem is a tired mind. Your problem is a tired emotions. Your problem is a tired spirit. It's a spiritual problem. It's a soul problem. You need rest for your soul. Not, not your muscles. No, some of you need rest for your muscles, but most of us need more exercise for our muscles. It's not that. That's not the problem. But we need rest from tension. We need rest from anxiety, from hurry, from worry, from stress, from the expectations of others, from comparison, and all these things. How do you unwind when you're exhausted emotionally? How do you unwind when you're overloaded emotionally? What's, how do you get rest for your soul? Well, a lot of people's first choice is entertainment. Turn on the TV, uh, you know, watch a movie, uh, maybe exercise, do a hobby, got a sport. Listen, all those things are fine, and they'll rest your body, but they won't rest your soul. None of those things can rest your soul. You gotta come to me, Jesus, to rest your soul. None of these can restore your soul. Only God can do that. The next verse, Isaiah 40, 29 and 31. He gives power to those who are tired and worn out. And he offers strength to the weak. Are you weak? He'll give you strength. Are you tired and worn out? He'll give you strength. Those who wait on the Lord will find new strength. Circle the word wait. Those who wait on the Lord will find strength new strength. Now do you realize that this is the exact opposite of what American or any of our other cultures, Chinese culture, um, you know, of our Saddleback Buenos Aires, uh, you know, Argentine culture, or German culture, Saddleback Berlin, all of our campuses. Uh, when we're empty inside, all around the world, culture says, go. When you're empty, fill it with activity. When you're feeling empty on the inside, you need to have more, you need to be more, you need to do more, you need to go more. And that'll fill you up. How's that working for you? It doesn't fill the emptiness. It doesn't, it just doesn't fill the emptiness. So culture says go, Jesus says come. Come to me. 
Come just as you are. And what you really need is time with God. That's what it means to wait on God. And Buddy did a whole message on that. Matthew 6, 6 says this. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. And just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. And the focus will shift from you to God. And you will begin to sense his grace. If you don't know how to do that, I encourage you to take class 201 on discovering the habits for spiritual growth. Take that class uh, on how to have a time with God or go back and review the message that we did on this. Okay, so first, I gotta get fed up and second, I've gotta come to Jesus. Okay, here's the third thing, give up control. Oh boy, here we go. Now we're talking about what the real issue is with the stress in your life. Give up control. The reason for overload is we're trying to control everything. The reason we do too much is we're trying to control everything. And we go around with it all depends on me and I've got to hold it all together. And listen, the greater your need to control, the more overloaded and the more stressed you're going to be in life. Sooner or later, you're gonna realize most of the things that matter in life are beyond your control. Pastor Sam Yoon, our pastor uh, who shared in one of the messages, he, he said something brilliant and I loved it. He said, the only thing God wants you to control is you, self-control. You can't control anything else. In scripture, you can't control your parents, can't control your kids, can't control your spouse, can't control your future, can't control your past, can't control the economy, you can't control your coworkers. The only thing you can control is self-control. That one's a good thing. That's one of the fruit of spirit. But the rest of it, we gotta give up control. And here's what Jesus says. This is what this verse means. I need to explain it to you. He says, first come to me, and then he says, take my yoke upon you. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Take my yoke upon you. Now he's not talking about a chicken yoke, an egg yoke. He's talking about a yoke, which is, as you know, a piece of wood where you put two cattle together to pull a cart. Instead of one cow pulling the cart, you yoke two cattle, or four, or six, or eight, or you can yoke horses, but you, you, you yoke animals together to pull the cart. And that way, um, what it does is it's a wooden frame that joins two animals together, it actually lightens the load because you're not pulling it all by yourself. Now, let me explain this. You say, wait a minute, this doesn't sound very relaxing to me. Take my yoke upon you. Sounds like more of a burden. I'm already carrying too much and Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. I want you to write this down. The purpose of a yoke is to share and lighten the load. It's not to put more on you. It's to take it off you. The purpose of the yoke is so you're not pulling the cart all by yourself. Jesus says, yoke up with me and I'll help you pull it. When two animals team up together, it's a whole lot easier than one animal. The reason you're so stressed out and overloaded is you're trying to carry everything by yourself. God never intended for you to carry everything in this life by yourself. So he says, take my yoke upon you, yoke up with me. And in verse 30, Matthew eleven thirty, 30, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why is my burden light? Because he's gonna carry it with you. He's gonna, he's gonna take the load that you've been carrying and he's gonna share it with you. And the New Living Translation says, my yoke fits perfectly. In other words, it fits your shape. Now, I need to explain to you, a yoke is a symbol of two things in the Bible. First, it's a symbol of partnership. And what you have here is an offer from Jesus Christ offering to be your life partner. He says, yoke up with me. You weren't meant to carry all of the load by yourself. Jesus says, I'll take part of it. Jesus isn't gonna add to your load. He doesn't have any load. There's nothing that he needs to carry. He has no load. So if he yoke, you yoke up with Jesus, it's not like he's putting it on you. He's taking it off you. He has no load. Psalm 55, verse 22, pile your troubles on God's shoulders. That's yoking up with him. He'll carry your load and help you out. In the message, 
I love that translation on that verse. Now, who do you think's got a stronger back, you or God? Obviously, God does. So if you're, if you're yoked, unyoked, then nobody's pulling your load by with you. Jesus says, join up with me, I'll help you pull the load with you. And the fact is, if you're overloaded, listen. Right now, if you're overloaded, it means one thing. At this very second, you're not yoked to Jesus. Because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. If those two words don't describe your life, easy and light, easy and light, it means you are not yoked to Jesus at this particular moment. Oh, you know him, but you're carrying the load yourself. You may know the Lord, but you're carrying the load yourself. And if your life right now is not easy and light, it means one thing. You at this moment are not yoked to Jesus Christ. You're not in partnership. You're not letting him carry the load. Every time you get detached from Jesus, every time you get disconnected from Jesus, you're gonna get stressed because you weren't meant to live that way on your own. So a yoke is a symbol of partnership. Second, a yoke is a symbol uh, of control because you use a yoke to guide the animals. And when you guide the animals, you keep them from going off in a ditch and you keep them going at a pace that they can manage. Now, I want you to write this down. When I'm yoked with Jesus, we move together in the same direction and the same pace. You can't go faster with Je- than Jesus goes if you're yoked to him. You can't go in a different direction than Jesus goes if you're yoked to him. When I'm yoked to Christ, I'm going in the same direction that God wants me to go, and I'm going at the pace God wants me to go, and I'm not gonna be able to go off in a ditch because he's not gonna let me go off in a ditch because I'm yoked to him. A yoke keeps us from going off on our own, getting into trouble. Look at these verses, Galatians 5, 25. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. I can't go faster than God. Now sometimes that's frustrating because sometimes you're in a hurry and God's not. The most difficult room to be in in a house is God's waiting room. When you're waiting on God, and God said, I'm gonna do it. We're gonna go to my pace. Keep in step with the Spirit. Romans 3, 23 in the message paraphrase says, our lives get in step, here's how we get in step, our lives get in step with God by letting him set the pace. Who's setting the pace in your life right now? If Christ is setting the pace, your life is light and easy. If if you're setting the pace, it's probably overloaded and stressed. You see, what you need, I'm telling you, friends, I love you, I'm your pastor. I pray for you, I love you. Pray for you all the time. You need more than direction, friends. You need a pace setter. You need a pace setter. And it is a pace setter who can tell you what, how to speed up and slow down in your life. Jesus, you know, it's interesting that in scripture, we never have any record of Jesus running anywhere. He was never in a hurry. And you won't be either if you're connected to Christ. Long time ago, I read this poem and I've kept it, kept it on a mirror for a long time. The Lord is my pace setter, I shall not rush. He makes me stop and rest for quiet intervals. He provides me with images of stillness which restore my serenity. He leads me in the way of efficiency through calmness of mind and his guidance is peace. And even though I have a great many things to accomplish each day, I will not fret, for his presence is here. His timelessness, his all importance, will keep me in balance. He prepares refreshment and renewal in the midst of all my activity. By anointing my mind with his oils of tranquility, my cup of joyous energy overflows. Surely harmony and effectiveness shall be the fruits of my hours, for I shall walk in the pace of my Lord and dwell in his house forever. 
Now let me let you in on a little secret. You're gonna be yoked to something in life. If it's not Jesus, it's gonna be something else that'll drive you and push you and pull you. It might be the expectations of other people that you're yoked to. What do other people think? It might be the expectation of your boss, or your spouse, or a friend. You're gonna be yoked something. Years ago, Bob Dylan wrote that song, you're gonna have to serve somebody. It may be the devil, it may be the Lord, but you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna serve somebody. So he says, take my yoke. If you're gonna be yoked to something, why not choose the easiest yoke? Why not choose the yoke that's light and easy rather than the one that the world offers you which is stressed out and overextended? He says it's easy. By the way, that word easy also means perfectly shaped. It fits your shape. It fits you. It's easy. It rests easy on you. And by the way, take my yoke as an exchange. I exchange my heavy yoke for Jesus' light yoke. That's a good deal. That's a big, take a deep breath and go, okay. Now here's the problem. The fact is, most of you, you don't have one yoke on you. You've got a dozen on you right now. You've got yokes that other people have put on you and put on you and put on you and expectations of others and on you and you've got so many yokes, you're crushing under the weight. The yoke's on you. I apologize for that very bad pun. The other day I asked, I asked one of my, my grandkids, Cole, who's 10 years old, I said, Cole, do you know what a pun is? I said, yeah, Papa. He goes, it's a, it's a joke that's not funny. <laughs> Out of the mouth of a 10 year old, man. <laughs> Fact is, most of us don't have one yoke around our decks. Got a dozen because you're trying to please everybody, and the yokes pile on top of each other. And we think the answer is to escape and go on vacation. But the problem is, when you go on vacation, guess what? You take you. <laughs> and, and, and the problem is up here in your mind. Now, he says, Take my yoke. What is he saying? Give up control. You're not going to be at peace until you do that. Until you give up control of your life to God. And every time I give up control, God gives me peace. I come to Christ. No matter what I've done wrong, he will accept me, not reject me. And then I give up control. I take up his yoke. So now he's going to pick the pace and he's going to pick the direction of my life and it gets light and it gets easy and every time I take that yoke off I'm going to put another heavy one back on me then the next thing he says is learn to trust number four learn to trust this is how you keep your tank filled learn to trust we did an entire message on this uh, Pastor um, Kurt uh, led, led this um, and um, it was learn, worry less, and trust more. Matthew 9, 29, the second part of the verse says this. Learn from me. Remember he says come, and then he says take, and now he says learn. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I have to admit, friends, I was a Christian for 30-something years and never understood how in the world is gentleness and humility lower my stress. I just never got it. I go, he goes, learn from me, because I'm gentle and I'm humble. And I'm going, I don't get it. How, I don't see how that would make me less stressed and fill my tank. But he says, you'll find rest for yourself. Jesus modeled how to live with purpose and peace. That's why he says learn. And this fourth step to reducing overload is to follow Jesus' model. He says, watch how I do it. Watch how I live. That means you gotta read the Bible. Watch how I live, watch how, and then do the same. He says, if you wanna be healthy, you wanna be balanced, learn from Jesus. Now, learning is a process, which means it takes time. You didn't get overloaded overnight. And you're not gonna get unoverloaded overnight. An over life, overloaded lifestyle, uh, you know, you took a long time to get in this bad situation. But you can, whatever you learn, you can unlearn and you can learn from Jesus. And you say, well, what can I learn from Jesus? Well, he says here, how to be gentle and humble. And why is that important? 
I mean, why didn't he say, learn from me because I have endurance and stamina? That's what I'd want him to say. Learn from me, watch me do it, because I have endurance and I have stamina. I have strength and I have stability. Now he says, learn from me, because I'm gentle and humble. What gives? Why are those things so important in stress relief? Well, it's because of the antidote to the biggest causes, two biggest causes of overload. The two greatest causes of overload in our lives are aggression and arrogance. What do you mean by that? Aggression is we don't wanna wait, we don't wanna pause, we don't wanna consider, we wanna jump into things right away, we wanna get overcommitted, we get aggressive and we do it now, 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 and, and that aggression, we don't wanna wait, and then arrogance is uh, we wanna control everything. I not only know what's best for me, I know what's best for you, and I wanna control you, and that causes a lot of marriage problems. And your ego is more responsible for stress in your life than you realize. The ag aggression and the arrogance. You're trying to do it all, you're trying to have it all, you're trying to please everybody, you're trying to act like Superman. And Jesus says the an antidote is gentleness and humility. I need to remind myself, and you need to remind yourself, I'm not, I'm not the savior of everybody. I can't save everybody. This last week I flew to New York City at the invitation of the Archbishop, or the Cardinal of the Catholic Church of New York, Cardinal Tim Dolan. I, he's a dear friend. I've stayed in his home a couple times and he asked me, I, he had heard that I, I do a message to our staff called Maintaining the Moral Integrity of Your Ministry. And I, I wrote a Saddleback Staff Ten Commandments that all of our staff sign, and I've taught this for our years to our staff, how to maintain the moral integrity of your ministry when so many others fall. He had me come back, said, I want you to teach it to about 1,500 priests. And I went on a two-day retreat with these guys. And while they needed that, what they also needed was they, so many looked burned out. They looked overstressed. Now, what was Jesus' secret of peace? Well, he only does what the Father tells him to do. So he's gentle and he's humble. He's not trying to be aggressive. He's not trying to be arrogant. He did what God told him to do and he didn't worry about the rest. 12 times in the book of John, he says, I only do what my Father tells me to do. He says, I just do what, I, what, I, what God tells me to do, what the Father tells me. Why don't you try trusting God instead of worrying and see if that doesn't lower the overload, the stress, give you a little bit more margin in your life. Look at these verses. Psalm 20, verse 24. Since the Lord is directing our steps, why try to understand everything that happens along the way? If God's directing your steps, you're yoked with him. I don't have to understand it. I know he's taking me in the right direction. And I know he's not gonna take me into a ditch. Psalm 142, three. When I'm ready to give up, hang on, some of you, I just described you. You're ready to give up. You're ready to give up on your marriage. You're ready to give up on your life. You're ready to give up on your dream, your health, your career, your education, your boyfriend. I don't know, what are you ready to give up on? It says there, when I'm ready to give up, he knows what I should do. And if I'm yoked up to him, he's gonna lead me in the right direction. How do I learn to trust more? Look here on the screen. Faith comes from hearing the word of God. It goes back to that making time with God every day in the Bible, reading the owner's manual. All right, learn to trust. Come to Christ, give up control, learn to trust. All right, let me give you two more, and these are fast, we'll just quit. Number five, start every day by filling my tank. Start every day by filling my tank. And I don't have to go over this because we did a whole message on it. But start every day by filling my tank. Get alone with God and get alone with his word. Faith comes from the word of God. And that's where you get the trust. And number six, stay connected to my church family. Stay connected to my church family. 
We were not meant to go through life alone. The very first thing God said about humankind is he said it's not good for man to be alone. God hates loneliness. It's not good for your soul. Being alone and being lonely are two different things. Being alone with God, that's a good thing. Being lonely, that's not a good thing. Now, whether you ever get married or not, you need relationships. You need people in your life. And in Corinthians, the Bible says women need men and men need women in the Lord. In the Lord, women need men and men need women. We need each other. That's why we emphasize small groups. If you're not in a small group, you, you could get picked off real easy. You, you don't have a stress safety net. Look at these two verses. Hebrews eleven twenty five. 25. Let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another all the more. Next week, we're gonna start a new series that I'm calling The Purpose Driven Family. I've never taught on this before, never taught on it. How do you have the purposes with your kids, with your spouse, or anybody else? And if you're not married, doesn't matter. These are how you have the purpose of God in relationship. And we're gonna look at that. And I hope you won't miss any in that series. And I'm gonna be teaching every one of those uh, in, in that message. Now, the next verse, Ephesians 1, 23. The church is Christ's body, and notice, it is filled with Christ who completely fills everything else. So what do you call a spiritual filling station? The church. I'm filling you up right now. I'm filling you up right now. Christ fills the church and, and, and Christ fills everything else. The church is filled with Christ and he fills everything else. You know why I wanted to do this series? Two reasons. First, I really want our church to be the healthiest church in America. I don't care if we're the biggest, never have. I don't care if we're the best known. What I am concerned about is your health. I want us to be the healthiest church. I want people to say, wow, those people over there, they're different. They're not stressed out. They're living on a margin. They're living at peace. And for your health and the health of your kids, and, and we're raising in America and around the world another generation of kids who are gonna take the stress to another level with all the technologies that come and I don't want that. I want us to be healthy. I, the, the next generation is dying for models of balanced living. And they don't see it in our society at all. The second reason is it's just a good witness to the rest of the world. How can we tell other people about Christ? Well, the best way we can tell other about, people about Christ is live unstressed lives. I can't think of a better witness than living an unstressed life in a world where everybody else around you is totally stressed out. How different would that be? If, if Christians are just as stressed as everybody else, they go, well, the only difference I see between my life and your life is you have a few extra meetings to go to every week. No, thank you. <laughs> don't blame them. I don't blame them. But if you could learn to live on a margin, you might wanna go home and listen to this series again. If you could learn to live, to come to Christ, to give up control, to learn to trust, to start each day with God. Start each day with God. And then to stay connected through your church family. It's that old worn out, but it's still true. If you got a fire in a big fire pit, campfire, and you got a coal and it's red hot, you take that coal and you set it out over here, it'll lose its fire quickly. And it'll go from red to dark and then to cold. But if you take it, that coal and put it back in the fire, it'll get red hot again. The more connected you stay to this group, the more red hot you're gonna be for God. The more you get away from it and go, well, I'm not gonna come all the time, I'm not gonna do that, you're gonna get cold. And then you're gonna get stressed. What's weighing you down? I don't know. Problems, finance, aging parents, health issues, finances. God brought you here today, no matter which campus you're at. God brought you here today so we could say this to you. Come to me. Come 
to me. Come to me. Look at this verse on the screen. Come to me, all you who labor. In other words, you're a workaholic and you're heavy laden and you're overburdened. I love this from the Amplified Translation. And I will cause you to rest. I will ease and relieve and refresh your souls. Take my yoke, team up with me. Take my yoke upon you and learn. Learn from me, for I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart. And you will find rest, relief, and ease, and refreshment, and recreation. All those words are in that one Greek word. You'll find rest, relief, and ease, and refreshment, and recreation, and blessed quiet for your souls. My family, our church family, this is the most important invitation you will ever receive in your life. In the spring and in the summer, we get all these wedding invitations and graduation invitations and birthday invitations. This is the most important invitation you'll ever get. Jesus is saying to you, come to me. Have you done that? You may have been in church all your life, but you've never done that. Or maybe you're here for the very first time, but you've never done that. You come to Christ, you turn to Jesus, you give up control, you learn to trust. Let's bow our heads. Have you ever come to Jesus? The starting point in unloading and the starting point in refilling an empty tank is to talk to Jesus about it. Tell him exactly how you feel. Tell him what's frustrating you. You know, sometimes even your best friends don't want to listen to your burdens. But Jesus will never ignore you. And he wants to be your partner. And he wants to be your pace setter. What an offer. So pray this prayer right now. Dear God, just say it in your heart. Dear God, I'm tired of being tired all the time. I'm tired of trying to control everything. I'm tired of a life without rest and peace and margin. Forgive me, forgive me dear God for all of the ways I've tried to be God and I've tried to control everything. And for the things that I've turned to for relief instead of turning to you. Today, Jesus Christ, I come back to you. Say this, I want you to be the pace setter of my life. I want to stop trying to control all the things I never could control in the first place. Forgive me for my arrogance. Forgive me for allowing my insecurities and my ego to take on more activities I could possibly imagine, manage. Forgive me for private, pridefully overloading my schedule and filling my life with less important things that I, I really had no time for what matters most. I wanna learn from your model, Jesus. I wanna be gentle and humble like you so that I can have the peace that you offer. With their head still bowed, if you prayed that prayer and really meant it, this is a turning point in your life. And I want to ask you to let me know about it in just a minute. I want you to take the card that's in front of you and check the box, I, I gave my life to Christ. And I want you to write your name on it and drop it in the basket in just a minute when we give our offerings so that I can send you some material and I can, I can pray for you. Father, I want to thank you for the liberation, the freedom that's going to come to many, many people this day in many, many places as they hear this message because we're coming to you and we're giving up control and we're learning to trust. I pray your blessing of peace on everyone in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for checking out this message on YouTube. My name is Jay and I'm Saddleback's online campus pastor and I would love to invite you to join our online community. Here are three ways you can take a next step. First, 
Learn more about belonging to our church family by completing Class 101 online. Second, don't do life alone anymore by getting into an online-only small group that meets on platforms like Skype, or learn more about hosting a group with your friends in your home. Third, join our global Facebook community to connect with others with the online community and be more engaged in the day-to-day. To take any of those next steps, visit saddleback.com online or email online at saddleback.com. Hope to hear from you soon.